Uh, welcome everyone to the 2020 Advances for Field Experiment Conference, um, albeit in very different circumstances from what we normally do it. Um, uh, it's been an amazing response by um, you all uh, and just a lot of people who have contributed to getting this conference going um, and, and creating and keeping the AFE community uh, moving along. So we, we've had, you know, 87 video presentations um, being given. That's on the web, that's on the website. So you can take a look at all of those um, presentations. I've started to go through some of them myself and I'm just really appreciative of the ingenuity, interest and willingness to, to keep this community going um, despite the difficult times. So, so thank you all for doing that. I encourage you all to to go through the videos as well, because having like four or five minute um, sound bites of a paper is really helpful <laughs> rather than reading the paper. So, so thank you very much to everyone for, for taking part in that. Um, so on, this, on the screen right now, you'll see kind of like the, the schedule for today. Um, we, we will start with, with Ariana, Ariana Bandiera's keynote. Um, just, just before I go through this, I just wanted to highlight a few sort of housekeeping items. Um, first is we'll kind of like keep this very similar to, or keep the structure very similar to what we did with the AFE seminar series, where we will want you to ask as many questions as you want. Do that in the, the Q&A uh, box that you see below. Um, we, for Oriana's keynote, we have a colleague, uh, Alexa Delfino, uh, as part of the panel. So if, if, you, if you have any like important questions about a particular, part of the, the talk, feel free to, to ask that and, and uh, Alexia will, will answer. And then John and I will sort of, you know, if there's any burning questions coming up, we'll, we'll, we'll answer those. So, so keep the questions coming through the Q&A. The more questions or comments, the better. So, so please do that. Secondly, we will be closing the webinar uh, during each break. So you see in this, in this schedule, we have various breaks, um, like at 10.50, we got a lunch break and then a, a two ten break. These are, you know, these are all central time, Chicago time, but um, we will close the webinar. So every time that you want to come to a new session, you've got to open up the webinar again, okay, with the same link. So, so please do that. So you got to log in at the beginning of each session. Um, and then in terms of the schedule, as I mentioned, we've got Ariana's uh, keynote in, in, in just over 10 minutes. Um, then we have a break. And then we'll have a, an hour long uh, first, our first panel session on experiments with firms where we have Zoe Pellan, uh, Jana Gallas, Rem Conning, and Tova Levine. Um, again, like obviously ask tons of questions during, during that panel and we'll hopefully get through them all. We'll have a lunch break, then we've got a second, second panel uh, at 1.10 uh, with Omar, Jonathan, and Dina going through the various um, methodological issues um, with field experiments. We'll have a break, another break, and then lastly, at the end of the day, which I know might be late for some of you in Europe, um, it is a social chat for, for junior. It could be for all faculty here as well in thinking about publishing field experiments in the top interest journals. And I think there'll be a lot of <laughs> interest in this panel as we'll have like, you know, a, a great list of speakers in thinking about, you know, what, what can we do as researchers to make our research more impactful are more likely to be taken, you know, um, more seriously um, at the top journals. So those, that's the kind of um, the schedule for today. And, and tomorrow we also have two other keynotes uh, and one further panel. So we have a, the first keynote in the morning is by Larry Katz at Harvard. We have a break, and then we'll have a gender and field experiments panel with Yuri, Corinne, Olga, uh, and Karen E will be moderating that. And the last keynote will be by Ulrike Malmadier from Berkeley. And that will hopefully be the close of the conference. So there's a lot going on. Uh, we appreciate you being involved in, in all parts of this. Um, and, and please, you know, uh, come to as many sessions as you can, ask as many questions as you can, just so that we can keep this going and, and um, keep the AFE um, community uh, going for this year and on to the following years. So again, thank you all for, for uh, being here. And I'll turn it, turn it over to John to discuss his intros. Cheers, John. Thanks, Rob. Um, 
and, and welcome everyone. I, I want to begin by, by thanking a bunch of people. This will feel like a, uh, a Grammy Awards celebration or an Oscars, but uh, Jamie, I want to give you a call out first. You have, you've just been wonderful um, as always. Thanks for putting all of this together. Uh, a fair amount of work, even when it is virtual. So I want to say thanks, Jamie. And also uh, Diana, Joy, Kayla, Shannon, and Susan. Thanks to all of you. Um, we know you've worked super hard on this conference as well, as you have over the past several years. So thanks so much. I, I also want to give a call out, as, as Rob did, to the video makers. The, it, it's sort of a, a difficult time, as we all know, and we brainstormed about what is the best way to give everyone a chance to present their recent research and to talk about their field experiments. And we felt that that was the best we could do and then have a, a series of keynotes and panels that we felt would, would really help young people, uh, mid-level, older people like myself. We, we, we tried to focus on helping each of those groups in some way in the panels and in the keynotes. But then the, the videos we hope can give people a chance for a little bit of exposure. And I, I agree with Rob, I, I looked at a few of them and some of them are longer than, than we had hoped, but nonetheless, um, all the ones that I've looked at have been wonderful. And I also want to thank the presenters who have agreed to review those videos. I, I very much appreciate your time. So let, let's now take a step back and, um, and, and think about how we got here. And this whole thing basically started back in 2011 when Yvonne Berenkai wrote me an email and said, John, I have some extra funding that I'm having a hard time spending and I can run a conference. So if you'd like to do a conference together, one at uh, Penn and one at the University of Chicago, um, I can fund that. So we began way back then and the general goal was one of inclusion rather than exclusion. When you're in a field like experimental or behavioral economics or, or any field, uh, uh, labor, IO, it's, it's very difficult to get your research out and to have people recognize and at least listen to your research. So our goal the entire, from the very beginning, was to be inclusive and try to have as many people as possible be part of our community. And, and I think that's worked. Now there, there is a, a silver lining of this conference. Usually we have roughly 200 or 250 people here, either at the University of Chicago, we had it at BU a few years ago, and, and next year we might have it in LA because Rob's out at USC. But the silver lining is, that uh, this year we have 725 people who have registered. So that gives us a shot to reach many more people who would otherwise be able to come to the University of Chicago. So we're very proud of that. Now, the difficulty, of course, is the timing. Uh, the timing is set up to be, you know, US centric. So we apologize to people around the world. We had to choose some timing. I was part of the ESA meetings that just took place. I bopped in and out of there where they had a 24 hour around the clock um, conference. And I'm not even sure how that worked, but I was looking um, or, or suspecting that deep in the evening, there might only be five people at those seminars, but who knows whether those were well attended. But we also, as Rob said, have 87 videos that, that have been created. That's awesome news. The, um, the editor panel has 300 people signed up. So if, if you still want to sign up for that, we're opening it up because again, we want to include rather than exclude. And I think that panel should be interesting in light of, it, it's difficult, you know, some people call it the tyranny of the top five. 
it's, uh, it's difficult to get any work published in top journals, much less uh, experimental work or field experiments where you're generating your own data. But, but nevertheless, I think we're going to hear from some great experts in the afternoon. But before that, of course, we're going to hear from several wonderful pa panels and also Ariana as we get started here. So I want to conclude by thanking all of you for attending. Thank all of you for registering. As you all know, our, our deal all the time is we try to break even. And that's why we haven't, uh, this year we absorbed a little bit of the cost. We didn't charge any registration fee. That's, that's not what we're here for, is to raise money. That's, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in uh, furthering the economic science using field experiments. And all of you are, are in a difficult time to, trying to generate your own data now. I, I understand that as, as well as, as you. It's, you. You can't put people in a room. Uh, internet is okay, but then people say you don't have a proper subject pool. Um, so we're, we're all, of course, trying to do the best we can and work as a community to continue to do field experiments and to push the economic science. So I, I hope everyone's healthy and safe. Thanks for coming. And I will turn it back over to Rob for the first introduction. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. Um, so the first keynote uh, of this conference is by Ariana Bandiera, um, and it'll be titled Field Experiments Behind the Scenes. Um, Ariana is the Sir Anthony Atkinson Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. Um, she's been there since 1999, started off as a, as a lecturer there in economics. And if you just like look at her research, you'll see the focus is on, you know, thinking about how to use monetary incentives and social relationships and how they interact to shape individual choices within organizations. Uh, and then thinking about how does that impact then on labor markets, the allocation of talent, and ultimately, you know, the welfare of, of, of individuals. So in addition to the Academy recognizing her fantastic research through you know, regularly publishing in, in the top uh, general interest journals in, in economics, She's had numerous research prizes for her work. She's had the ISA Young Labor Economist Prize, the Carlo Alberto Medal, the Esther Ozra Prize, and more recently, the Euro Janssen Award um, in 2019. So we're really happy to have Ariana here, not least because of my own personal interest um, from seeing Ariana's work in, in, from her string of publications in the mid to late 2000s. Um, again, all published in, in, the, in the top journals in thinking about how do you partner with a firm to really understand how to improve productivity um, in, within a company or across companies. And so the use of incentives and through the understanding of social connections and social incentives in the firm, it really did open up my eyes anyway to like, oh my God, maybe you can partner with companies. Maybe you can get inside of the HR department, the human resource department of companies to actually start to you know, gather the data to really understand what are these relationships within firms so that we can further understand why are the differences in productivity or why is a dispersion in productivity across different markets. So for me, anyway, that was a great, um, in reading those papers, it was a great lesson for me to, to think about, we can actually go out there and partner with companies to, to do academic research. So we're really happy to have Ariana here today. She's also the fellow of the British Academy, the Econometric Society, CIFA, Bread, and ISA. She's a co-editor of Econometrica, vice president of the European Economic Association, and a director of the Gender, Growth, and Labor Markets in Low-Income Countries program. So we're really happy to have Ariana today, and I'll turn it over to you, Ariana. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. Let me try and, well, here is where I've been for the last six months, but to be with you today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about field experiments, quite obviously, but I'm gonna do something a bit different. I thought for this uh, audience might be interesting to look behind the scenes of field experiments. So I think this audience does not need reminding that Field experiments have changed the way we do research in economics and the use of this research in particular. 
I think probably we all agree it's been for the best. But it's not without difficulty because in addition to the standard uh, difficulty of doing research, the key feature of field experiments is that academics have to talk with other humans. And that's not something that we are particularly good at. The other humans are the organizations that we partner with in order to run our field experiments. And there are two types, broadly speaking, of uh, organizations or partnerships. There are organizations that want to evaluate their policies, like NGOs that have uh, poverty alleviation programs, governments that try out new things. And, but these are policies that affect third parties. And then there are organizations that want to partner up to study the workings of the organization itself. I've done both things in my a career with field experiments. And in the best case scenario, the collaboration heals research that benefits both the researchers and the organization. And if we want to be really optimistic, society as a whole. In the worst case scenario, it's a grand waste of time. So how do we get there? How do we make a partnership successful? What I'm gonna do today is to try and go behind the scenes of experiments that I've managed to run, but also crash over the years. And I will try to distill some general principles, which I think are necessary for a successful collaboration. And uh, at the end, I will discuss briefly a new experiment that I'm running to understand the role of culture in organizations. So let me start for, you know, how do you collaborate with an organization? Well, you first have to find a partner. Then you have to understand the objectives and the constraints, both of the partner as well as you. Then you have to design the best experiment subject to these constraints and then share the findings and repeat. Now, most people think that the hardest part of running a field experiment is number one, finding a partner. I think that's actually not the most difficult thing. The most difficult thing for a successful field experiment is to understand the objectives and the constraints on both sides. Because often, what goes wrong is all due to a misunderstanding of what the partner wants and what the researcher wants. Designing the best experiment is the second hardest thing. Sharing the findings is not difficult, but we often forget to do it. And finding a partner, once you figured out two and three, is actually not that difficult. So let me tell you about two and three and why these are tricky. So the first thing you have to understand is what are the objectives of your partner? In an ideal world, the objectives are the same as yours. That is to find out what they do and whether they can do it better. This happens very rarely. A second type of objective that organization might have is to get some uh, validity some uh, approval of what they're doing by some independent researchers that can put some prestigious university logo on the report. That's still fine and it can work out, but more often than not, the objective of the partner is to get you out of the room. You somehow manage to get a partner through some contact. The partner has agreed to listen to you, but Ultimately, it's just agreed as a favor, and all he wants is for you to go away and stop wasting their time. This actually happened to me and keeps happening all the time, but the very first set of experiments which I ran with Ivan, that John was mentioning earlier, in a farm in the UK, we were asked to sit at the back of the room, very, very close to the door. I always thought that there was a trap door underneath so that if we made any noise, it would push a button and off we went. 
that is tricky, but not as tricky as the fourth type of partner, which is the partner that wants to buy, essentially, some flattering evaluation which, uh, where they can use your prestigious university logo. There are some partners like that. They're hard to avoid, also because they do look a lot like the second type. Now, researchers' objectives are equally important, and you have to be honest with yourself as to what you want to do with this experiment. I think the best objective is to find an interesting question, given the context. So you find out what the context is, and then given the context, you find out the most interesting question to answer. But normally that's not how people go about, and clearly that's not how I went about doing things. So one common way of going about running field experiments is to go with an idea of a theory and wanting to test the predictions of this theory. So I remember, um, maybe 10 years ago now, Nav Ashraf and I were very fascinated by the theory of intrinsic motivation crowd out. And we wanted to find a place where we could test it. And Nava told me that uh, she was working with a public health organization in Zambia. And this public health organization hired uh, hairdressers to sell condoms in their shops. And so we thought this was a great occasion to test the intrinsic crowding out hypothesis because you know selling condoms is a is a good thing because you can prevent HIV. So maybe if we pay the hairdressers, they would work less. And that's certainly what the NGO thought. And they used this as a reason not to pay them. So we set up our whole experiment to test the various channels that theory had uh, suggested, sorry, would um, uh, drive intrinsic motivation crowd out, such as reputation towards the public, your own reputation towards yourself, and so on. Then Nava had the brilliant idea of actually asking people before running the experiment itself. So she said, why don't we go and do a focus group that was the first time in my life that I heard of a focus group. And I said, what, with the observations? And she said, yeah, yeah, the observations, they're people. So we went to meet the observations and we started asking them, like, what if we pay you to do this job? Would you work less? And they were looking at us as if we came from some strange planet. They were very polite. They wouldn't tell us you guys are completely mental but they were looking at us as if they were thinking. And we went on trying to probe the different channels. Like, wouldn't you think that people think that you're a less good person if you do this? And after a while, one of them stood up and said, ladies, I don't know what you're trying to do, but in this country, if you do a job, you expect to be paid for it. And so off we went with our test of the predictions of the crowding out theory already done before even starting. So it's important, I think, to figure out whether your theory works in a given context by understanding the context first and foremost, to try and implement an experiment which you've already designed in a place where it makes no sense to implement it is bound to result in disaster. So what are the constraints? Well, the main constraint, I think the main stumbling block when you're dealing with organizations is that it's hard to explain what your incentives are. When you tell people that you're doing something for free, they know that it's not for free. So they know that you have to get something out of it. So it is important for you to be extremely honest with them as to what you get out of it, which is ideally a top five paper, uh, and explain why that is important to you 
and why somebody is willing to pay for your time so that you make this important scientific discovery. If they don't understand that, and if you don't make an effort to explain that, you'll end up with a lot of misunderstandings and then trying to second guess what you're trying to do, which is a very quick way to derail the whole experiment. Uh, there are things about finding the right organization but the wrong partner. So for instance, because the, any given intervention can create losses in the organization. So you have to create, you have to identify the person who can be a champion of this, who gets the research and who understands how it can be beneficial to them. Another main constraint is that in people's mind, randomness is unfair. So it's very important to understand why they think so and to explain to them why the apparent unfairness of randomness has a long-term gain in understanding what works best. So when we were working with the hairdressers in Zambia again, um, the enumerators themselves, that is the people that we sent out collecting data, thought that it was very unfair that some hairdressers were paid a lot to do this job and others didn't. And because nobody had explained to them why that was the case, they went around telling the subjects that this was going on. Luckily, this happened in a pilot. And so the old pilot had to be stopped because there was a mini revolution. And we made sure that when we implemented the, right, the real experiment, we actually trained the enumerator to understand why a field experiment can give you a better answer. A very big challenge and perhaps the biggest challenge after misunderstanding goals and incentives is the difference in horizon. So the, very often the organization needs to know things yesterday. No organization in the market could survive with the publication lags that we live with. No organization wants to wait 10 years to know the results of your research once it got published. So a lot of experiments that need to be done in the long run cannot be done unless you find a creative solution to this uh, mismatch of time horizons. The researchers are not that much better than the organizations. There is a tendency to ignore the context, like we were doing in Zambia with, uh, with intrinsic motivation crowd out. We have many other examples of things that would work in a context, but not in another. And hadn't we asked, it would have been a disaster. And situations in which we didn't ask, and indeed it was a disaster. And also researchers, myself included, once they get out in the real world, they get in a lecture mode. Like we know better than the people that have been running this organization for years, because we are professors at good universities, so we know better. Well, that typically is not the case, and it tends to alienate people. So once you understand what the constraints are and what the objectives are, you need to design the best feasible experiment. Now, the probability that this is the same as the experiment that you dreamt up when you first started is basically zero. The question that you have to ask yourself is whether it is better than the relevant counterfactual, which is not the dream experiment, but is rather not running an experiment. There is no straightforward answer because the only counterfactual that we know is the impossible dream experiment. And honestly, in many cases, we do not know. I'll give you an example here. We were working with um, an NGO in Uganda and uh, this NGO was um, 
testing out different ways of solving youth unemployment. In particular, they were comparing vocational training with firm training. So in one treatment arm, workers, well, young unemployed potential workers were given a free vocational training for six months. And in the other treatment arm, they were given, uh, the NGO would pay the firm to hire them for six months and teach them the job. And you see that uh, in this graph, if we had two quarters of data, which already is a fair amount of time, we would conclude that the firm training, the dependent variable here is the employment rate, so the months that they worked in the quarter, we would have concluded that the firm training, the apprenticeship, was a lot more effective than the alternative, which is the vocational training. But luckily, the organization agreed to keep the treatment and control separate for a lot longer. We followed them for four years. And you see that after that moment, firm training started out being the best, but then very soon vocational training overtook it. And had we, if the organization had told us we can only do it for two quarters, maybe we would have said yes, and we would have found that effect, which is the opposite of what happens in the long run. It would have ended up in the conclusions as external validity, but we would have never known. So luckily we could run it for longer. It's not clear what would happen. It's not clear ex ante how to know whether it's worth running the shorter experiment. The final and perhaps more challenging question that you have to ask yourself when you run a field experiment is what I call the dilemma of control. So as researchers, we run field experiments because they give us clean identification. A clean identification is what is science, right? What helps us establish causal relations. That's why we run field experiments in the first place, because we don't want to run X and Y using observational data because of all the identification problems. But if we can create a exogenous variation in X, we can measure its causal impact. That's why we do it. But the problem is that when we do it in the field, what we are calling observations, what we're calling treatment and control, are really people. And we really have to think twice, about three times, four times if needed, about the impact of the experiment on their lives, as well as on the performance of the organization, both during the experiment and when the experiment is over. I'll tell you a story about one of my papers where we could have gotten it badly wrong. And this basically haunts me every time I design a field experiment. So we happen to be, we, Nava, Ashraf and myself, we happen to be in the director's, the um, Ministry of Health HR director office in Lusaka, Zambia, in June 2010. At that time, oh, sorry. At that time, the director was about to recruit the first cohort out of uh, 5,000 new nurses to serve rural areas. Now, what he didn't know was whether he should have put them on a standard uh, Ministry of Health contract which would give them access to the full hierarchy of the Ministry of Health, so would give them career opportunities, or whether you should hire them just at an entry level, a separate class, mimicking the work that volunteers do on a day-to-day -day basis in the rural areas of low-income countries. And the question that he asked us 
you know, it's the intrinsic motivation question that came to hunt us. What will happen if I hire them as employees of the Ministry of Health, effectively making them into civil servants? Will that crowd out, and that's not the terms that he used, but that's what we heard, will that crowd out their passion for the community? So we designed a rather ambitious field experiment where we changed the way people were recruited in different districts. So in a set of control districts, we hired people with a pro-social spiel saying, you know, you're a community worker, making it sound a lot like a volunteer job. In the treatment districts, we went all the way towards the career angle. So we hired people by saying, you know, uh, you can become a part of the Ministry of Health, you can do courses, you can become a nurse, you can become a doctor. And this change in recruitment strategy had quite an effect on the applicant pool. So the treatment that is the come here, you can have a career, attra attracted people who were more qualified, they had better exam grades, they had more exams in uh, physics, chemistry, biology, all things that you would think are important for medicine, but they were also more selfish. So in a way that kind of crowd out of pro-social motivation happens on the extensive margin. You offer something that selfish people would like, selfish people apply. So at that point, we had this result. We knew that the applicants were different. And then we face a big dilemma, which is now that we have the pool of applicants, what do we do? Do we hire them randomly? Or do we let the ministry select them the way that they normally would? Well, obviously, if we randomize the recruiting and we also randomize the selection once people have applied, we have a lot more control. We have a lot more statistical power because there's much less heterogeneity. And we can estimate the causal effect of recruitment on performance directly. However, if we hire them randomly, we weaken the legitimacy of this position because these people would arrive in a community as somebody who was picked out of a hut. It would hamper teamwork because the people in the health post would have no say on who becomes a nurse. And so they would have to work with somebody that they didn't choose. And most importantly, if randomly we pick a random person, it means that we're not picking the best person for the job. And if we're not picking the best person for the job, this can actually result in worse health outcomes. So we thought and thought, and in the end we thought that risking the health outcomes of people who already had very limited access to health services was too much of a risk to take. And so we went on with the standard Ministry of Health recruitment. So there were panels and the panels selected the very best people. You can see it, well, you cannot see it because the, the slides has gone, uh, but they selected the best people, the ones with the highest qualifications. And these people ended up treating 30% more households. They saw more patients, organized more meetings, this led to a lot more facility utilizations, like women giving birth in uh, health clinics as opposed to being given birth at home. And the bottom line is that two years later, in the areas of treatment, there were 25% fewer malnourished children. Had we randomly picked the person, we wouldn't have picked the best ones because they would have been picked randomly. And maybe that 25% would be a lot smaller. So whenever you run an experiment and you're thinking, 
I want clean identification of something. Think of the price, because obviously it's worth paying in many cases, but sometimes it might not. So this brings me to the second part of my talk, which is um, coming back to organizations, so like the Ministry of Health in Zambia, and how their success hinges on three things, which is all have to do with people, because organizations are made of people, which is how to hire them, how to motivate them, and how to retain them. So I assume that everybody is still here. It's very, it's very weird to give this talk without seeing anyone. Thank you, Rob. I needed that. Um, so let me tell you a bit, uh, <laughs> thank you, John, about the literature, okay? We, by now, have a lot of experiments on motivation, okay? Which is a great thing, because we didn't know before. Right? The very first piece of evidence on the effect of peace rates on productivity was Ed Lazier's paper on observational data in 2000. And since then, many people, like John and Rob to start with, and, and us and many others, have done great work in understanding how to motivate people in the workplace. And not just with money, exploiting social relationships, exploiting the desire to be better than others, exploiting intrinsic motivation. We've done a lot of work on this. Now, when I talk to organizations, especially very large ones, this is what they tell me. They don't tell me my main problem is to motivate my workers. I know how to do that. They tell me it's partly finding the right people, but really the big challenge is that once you find the right people, how do you convince them to stay with you? And this I always found puzzling, but I mean, I can understand why there are not that many experiments on this because selection experiments take a lot longer and they're very expensive because you have to collect data on the entire applicant pool and the counterfactual applicant pool. And of course, retention experiments take even longer because you have to wait for the person to go through the firm and decide whether to quit or not. They require a lot more data, so they're more expensive and take longer. That's the last thing you want. On the other side, for the firm, we know by now, because we've run a lot of experiments on incentives, that really the most that you can improve a person is 20%. So me, I'm my very best. If you give me all the incentives in the world, I might be able to write 20% more papers, no more than that. But if instead of hiring me, you hire John or Rob, well, then you get like 100% more papers. So the fact is that the productivity difference within person, just due to motivation, is very small relative to the productivity difference across people. Okay, so getting the right person is probably more important than motivating a given person. And also, quits are very costly because if somebody leaves, it's not just that you lose a worker, the productivity of their team goes down, and then you have to replace them, and that costs you money because hiring a new worker is very expensive. So there are good reasons on both sides for why this doesn't happen. Now, turnover depends on job satisfaction, that's quite obvious, and pay is a very important element, but it's not the only one. And in particular, every firm can offer a performance pay package. Okay, if we go back, this is a sign of age, when you have to go back to something that was written at least 50 years ago. So if I go back to March and Simon, 
you know, that book on organizational economics in 1958, what do we read there? We read that the main satisfaction, I mean, once you satisfy material needs, once you have a good pay, a good package, your productivity is rewarded, really what makes you happy to go to the office is whether that suits your self-image, whether you go and you see yourself like a, an ambitious person and you go work in an ambitious place. And most importantly, you go work for an organization and you don't know which person you have to interact with. Unless you're working in a family firm that you know that you have to see your father-in-law every day, which is predictable, but not necessarily good. Um, the issue is, if I have to talk to the director of HR, which I've never spoken to in my life, is he gonna be a nice guy? Is he gonna be ambitious like me? Or is he gonna be, I don't know, extremely pedantic and he's gonna bore my head off? So both these things depend on the culture of the organization. That is, we have measured monetary incentives. We have measured social incentives that are the specific social relationship between two people. What we really need to understand is the empty spaces in between people. That is, if I meet a person at random in my university, what type of person is that gonna be? If I get a new boss, what type of boss is she gonna be? So that's all organizational culture. Different organizations offer different cultures. And actually, one thing that we discovered recently is that they spend a lot of money proving it. So let me tell you now about two recent collaborations that Nav and I have set up. We're working with two large multinationals whose names cannot be revealed so I had people guessing about fruit for about five years. Now we have to guess about bank names and, uh, and a consumer's good company. Okay, these are both large and both anonymous. And both of them run programs that aim to signal their set of values to their employees. And they spend a lot of money on these programs. And they believe that these programs are essential, that if they don't do it, people will leave. Okay? So our ultimate goal, which is not something that I will meet in the next 10 minutes, is to really understand the effect of culture on performance. So in order to do that, we of course need some exogenous variation in culture. And in order to do that, we need a field experiment, but before then, we need to understand the context. That is, is there really something called culture in an organization? So from now on, in the, next of the, in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the anonymous bank, because that's a bit more advanced than the anonymous consumers good company. But the spirit of the two experiments is quite similar. So um, a few months ago, well, almost a year now. We oh, brought, Oriana, yeah. Florian, so I'll, I'll break it up a little bit here so you know you're not just speaking to the Thank uh, you. black hole, if you will. <laughs> um, so, so just a, a, this is excellent, by the way, so far. This, this, this is super. Um, so I should stop now. Yeah, exactly. Quit while you're ahead, right? No, no, no. no. This is super. But... I, I just wanted you to give us some flavor about how you're viewing culture. Should we think about this as an amenity in the workplace that can be valued just like any other amenity in terms of um, attraction, retention, and there will be a trade-off between that amenity and the other amenities in the workplace that we can value just like a hedonic equation would value in amenity with uh, in a basket of goods and services? So that's what I thought to start with. And the reason I thought that is that we economists are used to think as the principal agent model. Mm -hmm. So we always think of one principle 
say the boss of the bank, one agent, the employee. So the boss can give me things that I like in exchange for something that he wants. And these things can be money, can be a car, can be culture, can make me feel good about working for them. But in that model, you're right, it's just an amenity, like any other. So you can price it. But the world is not like the principal agent problem. There is one principal, and then two principal below him, and then four agents, and then eight agents, and then thousands of agents. And when people, ah, I'm terrible with this. And when people are in a place, in a workplace, they have to interact with many agents that they don't know. And so at that point, culture is more than an amenity. It's more than something that makes you feel good about going to work. It's also something that makes you productive at work. So I think that it has both aspects. People value it in and of itself. But also importantly, I think it affects productivity. Now, do I have any proof of this? Today, no, but that's the goal of the experiment, to try and understand precisely that. Okay, super, thank you. You're welcome, thank you for giving me sign of life. Um, so as I said, that is the final and very, very distant goal in the distant future. So our first step was to try and figure out whether indeed there is something distinctive about the firm. And what we did, this is a purely descriptive paper, we ran a survey to over 40,000 employees of this one bank who are uh, working in 55 different countries. And they are typically from these countries. And we take the 11 questions in the World Value Survey as what values do you want your children to have, which are like your top three values that your children should have. And then we try and figure out whether the bankers in this particular bank reflect the values of the countries that they live in or whether they have specific distinctive values. And what we found is that on a number of values, they really reflect society. So this, on the horizontal axis of these graphs, you have the share of World Value Survey respondents who, re who say that that value is important. And on the vertical axis, sorry, I can't see them without glasses, you have the share of bankers that say that that value is important. So for six out of 11 values, here I show you two, because otherwise six wouldn't fit, there is a very strong correlation between society and the bankers. So independence, for instance. Independence is something that in society where independence is not important, the bankers would tell you that it's not important. And in societies where, the where society thinks it's very important, the bankers will also think it's important. The red and green dots separate bankers between bosses and subordinates. So it's a work level division. Hard work is the same as independence. And perhaps more surprisingly, selfishness is exactly the same. There is a lot of variation in selfishness across societies and bankers reflect that. But then, for the other five, there is really a lot of specificity. So there is a lot of variation across societies on how much they think that obedience is an important value. All bankers think that is not. Same with thrift and same with religious faith. On the other hand, on imagination and determination, bankers are all crowded along the same spot. Now, what does this mean? Probably nothing, but let's go a bit further than this. So now that we have this distinction between the values that are specific to the bankers and the values that are 
aligned with society, we can see what happens to the bankers, the young bankers, who have the same value as the bank. And that's what we find. We find that actually the bosses are even more distinct than society and that having the same values as the bosses is more likely to get you promoted. So there is a selection by values. Now, we don't know whether these values are good in and of themselves, like imagination makes you more productive. I have no clue. Or whether it's just a matter of matching with people who are like you. So that's why we're running an experiment with the bank. The bank has a flagship program to shape culture, uh, which is a volunteering platform. Now, you have to pause a minute to try and figure out what volunteering got to do with banking. But their logic is that they want people to understand, or at least they want to hire and retain people who have a more socially oriented outlook than the typical person that goes into banking. And so they want to signal that the bank cares about these things, not just by, you know, paying uh, money to evade taxes, donating money to evade taxes, but actually by paying leave for two days a year to workers who volunteer. And they go further than that. They actually create a centralized online system that works a bit like an Amazon marketplace where workers can choose where to volunteer. So the bank organizes volunteering opportunities with different charities. And then the workers can choose which of these opportunities to pursue. And the bank pays for it. Okay. So the scale of the program is rather large. There are the cost of running the platform, which they, in a somewhat disturbing way, haven't been able to tell us exactly how much they are, plus the wages that they pay to the people while they are on volunteer leave. So there is about 16 hours per employee that are available for uh, this, uh, this program. So the total cost, to cut a long story short, is about 155 million US per year, globally. And that's about 1% of the wage bill. So it's not a trivial program. Now, what do we do? Well, we run an encouragement design. We send some workers, but not others, an email to promote the new platform. And we do a two-step randomization. We assign offices to different treatment groups and the different treatment groups differ in the intensity of treatment, that is how many people get the email. And then within each office, we have treatment office, treatment uh, teams and uh, control teams. The size of the sample, so the first randomization is done across 750 offices. There are about 4,000 teams and 27,000 employees. So this is how it looks. We have a first group where a quarter of the teams get treated, a second group in which half of the teams get treated, and a third group in which three quarters get treated. We look at an outcome, a turnover, because that's their main concern. Uh, over a period of nine months, because that's where we got the data, now we got the new data, but we didn't get them in time for today. And the average yearly turnover in the bank is 18%, so about a fifth of all their workers leave. And so in this particular period, it was 12%. So the estimates that I'm gonna show you now, look at the impact of treatment within an office. So we exploit the individual level variation in getting the treatment so that we control for every characteristics at the office level. And what we find is that treated employees are less likely to quit. Okay? They are three percentage point less likely to quit, which is 21% of the mean. But what I find 
very interesting is that the impact is much bigger in bigger offices. And the reason I find this interesting is the predictability of relationship, as uh, Simon and March were pointing out to. That is, if you're in a big office, which is completely anonymous, knowing that the other people are of a certain type makes it more predictable to know how you have to interact with them. And you see here, this is basically the effect of office size on quits, the red one in control, and uh, the yellow one is treatment. And you see that the delta is much bigger in bigger offices. And also, kind of as a sanity check, the effect is much bigger on newcomers. Because if you've been in the bank for some 25 years, no program is going to change your opinion about the culture. You probably already selected yourself into the bank. So there is hardly any difference for the people who've been there for a long time. And there is about four percentage point difference for those who've been there for a year. So if we compare what's the benefit of this, it's really hard to say because there are large direct and indirect costs associated with the worker separation. I think that in the literature, a conservative estimate is that each turnover costs about 5% of total labor cost. So we use that together with the turnover data in the bank to estimate the average cost at 20,000. Okay, with a reduction in three percentage point, that basically only on salary, gives you a saving of 120 million. Now, the actual cost, given the number of people who volunteered, was 10 US million. If everybody were to volunteer, it would be 155 million. So, but then again, the effect on turnover might be higher in the longer run. So I leave you with this, which is to say that this is really only the beginning of something huge that I hope many people will want to work on. Because we do have, by now, I think, a decent understanding of incentives, both the monetary incentives and the social relationship, those that derive from social relationship, which is not to say that there's no more work to be done there. But at the margin, I think what we need to understand better is the role of culture. And as John was asking me, as usual, seven slides before then I got to it, we need to understand the mechanism whether really shared values make the workplace more effective or whether it's just an amenity. You want to hang out with people who are bleeding hearts or hyper competitive like you. Okay, but let me bring back to where I started from, which is the strength of field experiments. In my mind, the strength of field experiments is precisely this. You leave your office and go to the fields to see the world through the lens of economics. So you see some workers picking strawberries and you think, oh my God, these guys have a, a relative incentive scheme. They're gonna cooperate at the expense of the firm, like in a public good game. So you have that frame of mind and you go and you test it. But then you start seeing things that your lenses don't allow you to understand. And so you come back with new and hopefully most of the time better lenses. And that's where the strength of the method lies in. Arana, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that two-part presentation. Uh, it was really great. Thank you. One, one question I have, I think there's tons of questions we have here in the, in the Q and A and, and John and myself, but I was just wondering on your thoughts on, you know, you, you mentioned like the intensive extensive margin for, for productivity. And, and do you think um, this is obviously looking at an organization and, and doing an experiment like this is extremely difficult. So this is amazing what you've done. But how, how, do, you, how do you think, or what are your beliefs about that extensive margin decision on culture? So if I'm comparing two jobs, am, am I, do I have the knowledge about or the information about the culture of those two organizations and how am I trading that off? As opposed to doing it as a field experiment when you're within an organization. Um, just it, it'd be good to get your thoughts on that. That is, uh, that is a very good question. 
because I think that there is a lot of value being destroyed in people signing up with organizations which then exposed to find out they were not a good fit. Um, so I think organizations do a lot to explain the culture of the organization once people are hired, but there's still no way of credibly communicating what the culture is like at the hiring stage. Um, mostly because once people are in, you can actually spend money on showing this and that gives you credibility. When you're hiring people, it's harder because everybody tries to you know, dress it up in the way that they think would get them the best workers. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, on the recruitment side is harder. But on the, on the retention side, actually something that I haven't discussed here for lack of time, is that the aim of the program is not just to keep workers, it's to keep the right workers. So we should see that somebody actually leaves as a consequence of this. And ideally the ones who leave are the ones that would be worse off in the firm. Yeah. Yeah, and what I like about this approach, like that long term, is you can see, uh, do they get promoted? Do you actually find that Peter principle uh, exactly. with help? That could be quite cool, right? So absolutely. exactly. Cool. Uh, yeah, sorry, Anna. That was that was really wonderful. I I did really appreciate the broader implications in your general thoughts on field experiments with firms to start, and then the more specific um, research ideas. I, I think that that really worked well, and you can tell from the um, from the comments and questions as well. So. This is a question from V, and, and V is a, a student, a PhD student at Monash University. She asks, what are your thoughts on the level of compromise when the partner and the researchers disagree on whether some outcomes results are valuable, especially those that are welfare enhancing for the general public, but not so much for the partner? Hmm. That's a tricky one. So as I said, uh, the most difficult thing, and I hope I've convinced people, is to align incentives between the two partners. If there is no alignment, I think it's not worth doing. Because in one way or the other, you know, the partner in the end pulls the string. So if the partner doesn't want you to do the experiment, if you haven't agreed to start with, it might let you run with it for a bit, but then it might just pull it. And then you've basically wasted time. And also, if the partner does not believe in the experiment, if your interests are not aligned, they're never going to implement it properly. And you're never going to know whether the results are due to the fact that, uh, you know, the experiment or whatever treatment you were trying didn't work, or whether it wasn't implemented properly because it was being sabotaged. So any time that you can spend investing in trying to align incentives is really time well spent. Um, the next question I had was, so, so you set up in, in, in terms of thinking about the incentives, aligning yeah. the incentives between yourself and, and the organization, understanding their objectives, and then um, you know, designing the best experiment. Uh, and maybe sometimes that's easier. Sorry, that, 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 that's more difficult than actually finding the right partner. I just wanted to get your thoughts on, based on your experiences of all the successes and failures <laughs> that you had, is that, is, is that, does that relationship hold in countries like the UK and the US as opposed to working in Zambia and Uganda, where um, us as researchers might be seen as oh, have a different sort of image from the two perspectives? I haven't thought about the, I always thought it from the point of view of like, we can do it for free and that's worth a lot more to them than it is to the government of the UK. Although at this rate, believe me, they will be needing free, this is recorded, I don't care. They'll be needing a lot of free advice. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's really a difference in uh, economic development, but it's much harder to do um, things in the US or in the UK just because of the sheer size of the bureaucracy. 
like it's relatively easy once you're at the Ministry of Health in Zambia to talk to the permanent secretary because the hierarchy is not that long. But to get to the permanent secretary in the UK, it might take longer. Absolutely. Um, great. And then there's, there's a question on um, the time horizon mismatch between organizations and, and researchers. Um, so uh, this is a question from an anonymous attendee. Most of the times the organizations just want to see a policy report with the results and not necessarily interested in the research paper or the, or the mechanisms. Um, however, if the results change during the publication process, it's tricky to go back and explain to the organization you know, things are, uh, are not so great or things are better. Um, so how do you normally deal with that uh, in your collaborations with partnerships? So I'm not as quick as the organization would want me to be. I'm way quicker than ideally I would be with them. So I normally, in any experiments where you have a treatment and a control group, I mean, any field experiment, you have kind of a headline figure, right? Which tells you treatment is more productive than control. That headline figure you can share because if that's going to change, then there is really a problem with the experiment. Of course, what you cannot share is all the details on the mechanism that are going to take longer to come up. In the example of the training programs that I just gave you, the organization really wanted to know. And so we told them, after two quarters, this one is doing better. But then two quarters later, we had to pick up the phone and say, you know, stop the press. If you're charging, you know, if you're moving all the resources in that one program, actually the other guys are picking up. And there was a perfectly valid economic explanation for that, why that was the case, because in firm training, you have a job as part of the training. So many people were staying in the firm longer after the training was done. And so they had more jobs. For the vocationally trained worker, they actually had to find a job. But once they found the job, it was much easier for them to move from job to job because they had the certification. So the original result was not wrong. It was correct because there was an advantage in that type of scheme in the short run, but in the long run, the advantage swaps. Got it. Got it. And then one last. I want to, Rob. Can I follow up on the on the short term, long term, um, with a with a scientific angle? Yep. So, <clears throat> Oriana, I've argued in papers as well that we don't have as many longitudinal or long run effects as we should, or let's say in a normative sense, we, we have a lot in early childhood and we do reasonably well there, but in, in other studies we don't. And th this is sort of tipped off by somebody who talks about control in the long-term experiment. So th there are different words for it. I've always talked about that's a long derivative and we tend to do short run substitution effects, which is a short, kind of a short derivative. Um, maybe you can give the folks some insight about how you think of the trade-off between a scientific study and results. And this could come up later in the editor's panel too, but where um, in, in the, the degree of trust or you have in terms of not presenting false positives in the long run versus when you present short run substitution effects. Absolutely. It's a very tricky question, especially given how our profession is organized. You have seven years to get tenure. You can't design a 10 year experiment. You can't put, you know, your tenure. It's the time horizon just doesn't match. So I think, you know, economic theory, which is the big elephant in the room, which I didn't put in my slides, but I wanted to, really comes to the rescue. Because if your experiment is informed by theory, a bit like our experiment, we can claim, we can boast about this. Our experiment with the training was informed by theory. We thought about it before. Uh, that will give you short run predictions and long run predictions so that you can actually learn something in the short run and then continue working, continue waiting. I think there are very few cases in which the only outcome of interest is in the very long run. I think the path 
is of interest. So seeing the first year or the first quarter is an interesting result. Same thing with um, um, you know, recruitment experiments. The effect on the pool is interesting in and of itself. Then if you want to know the effect on performance, you have to wait until people start working and have enough time to perform. But I think my advice would be to just use theory so that you have an understanding of what should happen in the short run. And if that's of interest, then do that and then wait until the long run comes. Okay. Very good, thank you. Rob, you can go ahead. Yeah, I think just one last question. Um, I think we're towards the, the end of our time limit. Um, will be, and this is a question asked by uh, David McKenzie. I think this is actually like a really uh, interesting question for the, for the young researchers uh, in the audience, which is what is your, your, your thoughts in terms of the issues involved with researchers deciding to keep the partner anonymous or not? So in your early papers, I was trying to guess who is this, you know, fruit picking company. Um, is this a not, uh, like, is the anonymity like conditional on the results? Um, or do you like do this ex ante? Or is it sort of something that's agreed after the sort of the research has been, has been done and you communicate that to the partner? And what's your advice on, on getting these type of agreements in place for young researchers as they start to embark on these type of partnerships? So the bigger the organization, the bigger the uh, legal team, and the bigger the legal team, the more headaches you're gonna get. So even if they're anonymous, they have so many conditions. Now, um, I think anonymity, most of the time is to protect the organization, not from bad results, but the opposite, from revealing secrets to the competition. And in that case, I think it's worth it because we understand something about the real world without you know, having negative consequences. Of course, a conditional anonymity, that is, if we do well, you say who we are, if we do badly, you don't, is never acceptable. So you, the agreement that you have with the organization is that you will publish the results no matter what. And that uh, if they want the name to be anonymous, it will remain anonymous regardless of what the findings are. Got it. Thank you so much, Ariana. Um, that was an amazing uh, first keynote for the conference. I really appreciate your time uh, on, a, on a UK evening to do this. So we really are appreciative of the talk. Yeah, absolutely. Spectacular stuff. Um, a great beginning to our, our 2020 conference. But uh, Oriana, you are not off the hook yet. We will see you in a few hours joining us for our social chat for all faculty um, publishing in top general interest journals. But I do want to thank you. That, that was really tremendous. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me, making me think back 20 years. <laughs> The good old days. Times were a lot simpler back then. Good old days. Exactly. We could run baseball card experiments and everyone would be okay with it. That was fine. <laughs> Times have changed, but thanks so much. Okay, see everyone soon. Yeah, just, just a note to everyone, uh, please log off and then log back on in, in 15 minutes for the, for the next panel. Um, and the next panel is Experiments with Firms, which uh, follows on nicely from Ariana's talk where we have Zoe Cullen, Jana Gallas, uh, Rem Conning, and Tova, or Tova Levine talking about how do the young researchers develop these partnerships with, with private organizations, how they run their experiments, what are the, the results and what are the lessons learned, and, and hopefully we'll see you all in, in 15 minutes. So uh, log, log off and log back on and we'll see you soon. Okay, bye everyone.